Okay, and we're back. All right, this is another video. It's part of a whole series on in preparation for the multi-state bar exam. Um, these videos are intended for the use of uh, students preparing for the bar exam. I'm not going to hit up every issue. We don't have that kind of time. Some issues will be discussed in more detail than others. And if you're a J student, JD student, uh, be warned. Um, I would expect uh, more detail than we, we would otherwise be covering for the bar exam. Okay, now, now this next video is going to be on personal jurisdiction and service of process on, and notice. Now my plan was to do service and process and notice after personal jurisdiction, but we're having technical difficulties and we're on a limited clock here. So I'm going to do uh, 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 procedural due process and notice first because I can just talk through that. And then afterwards we should have the, uh, the, uh, the video fixed and we can then go into personal jurisdiction for which I have a, a, a hopefully helpful audiovisual. All right, procedural due process is different from substantive due process. Substantive due process you talked about in con law. So substantive due process would be the right of privacy, right? All the famous Supreme Court cases regarding a fundamental rights, right? The right to privacy, things like that. Procedural due process is not about a right like that, but rather about the rights you have regarding procedure when procedure is used to deprive you of uh, a life, uh, liberty, or, or property, okay, under the 14th Amendment. All right, the procedure's attendance to deprivation of, for example, property. And what the Supreme Court tells us um, in the Matthews case is before you can have any sort of property taken away, all right, there has to be reasonable notice and an opportunity for you to be heard, right? And, and you should remember that from a number of cases. It's a fundamental maxim of a procedural law that actually guides the creation of the FRCP itself. So for example, things like the, 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 the requirements under Rule 4 for the service of the summons and the complaint okay, are written against the backdrop of the requirement of procedural due process. So for example, one form of classic service of the summons and complaint is that a process server comes up to you, says, hey, are you so-and-so? Okay, well, I'm a process server, here's a complaint, and summons you've been served, right? Personal service. Because as long as you're given sufficient time to answer the complaint, right? Well, you've been personally served, you have actual knowledge of what you're being sued for, okay? You've gotten all the Constitution um, is required, right? You've gotten notice and a reasonable opportunity to defend yourself. And that's a constitutional requirement. Now. In the con context of deprivation of, of not, not say, uh, of, of uh, in certain contexts, we also look to the Matthews test. Okay, the Matthews test uh, deals with the deprivation of uh, property uh, by judicial process. For example, by a, a prejudgment seizure. So, say for example, uh, somebody files suit against you and then has your wages garnished even before there's a final judgment against you, right? Or somebody shows up and seizes your um, goods, say your uh, stove and your furniture, but there hasn't even been a final judgment against you. Well, here the court looks to the uh, uh, three-part uh, test uh, from Matthews. It looks to three things, okay? And make sure that you do know these in case this comes up. The first is the private interest. I'm just going to read these to you. The private interest that will be affected by the official action, okay? So for example, it's your wages that are being garnished, your interest in having an income, right? Second, the risk of an erroneous deprivation of such interest through the procedures used and the probable value, if any, of additional or substitute procedural safeguards. So, okay, say for example, your wages are garnished upon the mere submission of the complaint to the court and say the clerk will then uh, authorize the sheriff or some other state official to have your wages garnished and no judge is involved, right? Well, the danger here is that you're going to be deprived of an income, okay? You won't be able to pay your bills, your lights will be turned off, your house might be foreclosed, and here under my fact pattern, it was the clerk of the court that authorized it upon the mere filing of the complaint, right? Well, the danger here is without having a judge at least take a look at it or requiring something like an affidavit or like a bond, the risk of erroneous deprivation of your, your wages uh, might be quite high, right? So what's the value of additional safeguards? Well, how about a bond? 
the plaintiff wants to garnish your wages, make the, the plaintiff put on a bond. That's one possible additional procedural protection. How about affidavits from the plaintiff? That might be an additional procedural requirement that might reduce the uh, danger of an erroneous um, deprivation. So for example, the plaintiff not just files a suit, but has to file an affidavit under penalty of perjury. So if the plaintiff turns out to lie, guess what? The plaintiff can be uh, prosecuted for perjury, right? Another possible safeguard is have a judge decide whether or not your wages are going to be garnished, right? That's an additional layer of somebody looking at the situation before your wages are garnished. Now, that's not to say that any particular sort of requirement is required in all circumstances. The Matthews test is it depends on the facts, right? It's very factually contextual. But these are examples of additional procedural safeguards. Um, the last step is the government's interest, or if it's a case filed by a private litigant, also the, the interest of the private litigant, um, including the function involved in the fiscal and administrative burdens that the additional or substitute procedural requirement would entail. So for example, is the value of having affidavits or bonds or having judges decide things before there's a prejudgment seizure, um, would that be worth the additional cost by having judges do more things and having plaintiffs have to do more things and things like that? So it's, it's the Matthews balancing test. All right. Now, next, let's talk about due process and the rules themselves. Due process gives the constitutional limits as to what is and is not um, acceptable. So say, for instance, I decide to sue you and I decide to serve you by having the process server put the uh, complaint and summons in your garbage can under the theory that it's near where you live, right? Is there any real chance that you're going to get actual knowledge of the suit? Does that seem fair? You can say it. No. In fact, it seems constitutionally unfair, right? So the Supreme Court tells us that notice has to be reasonably calculated towards the possibility of actual knowledge, right? So you can't engage in tricks to try to uh, prevent actual knowledge. So when we talk about notice, we need to make sure the Constitution is satisfied, all right, the stuff I've talked about, but also the rules themselves, like the rules of service, the rules of uh, 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 service under rules four and five. Okay, which are written against the backdrop of the Constitution. And this I'm only going to talk about for about two minutes. All right? Rule 4 governs the service of the summons um, and the complaint. All right? Rule 4 requires different types of service depending on who's being served. So there's different provisions for service on an individual uh, residing in the District of, of the United States. There's different requirements for serving an individual in a foreign country different sections for dealing with service on um, a governmental official, service on corporation, and so on and so forth. I'm just going to give you just one example. Service on an individual residing in a judicial district of the United States. All right. Well, there are federal bases for service under Rule 4E. For example, personal service. You could serve somebody under Rule 4E, service on an individual residing in a district, All right, just by handing them the summons and uh, the complaint. That's traditional service. Or you could serve them by leaving the summons of the complaint at their usual place of abode, you know, like their home, right, with someone of suitable age and discretion. So the process server comes up and says, hey, you know, is this where Joe Schmo lives? Yes. Who are you? I'm Joe Schmo's spouse. Oh, okay, you seem like a person of suitable age and discretion. You're an adult and you seem sober. Um, here you go. And now Joe Schmo has been served under Federal Rule 4E, right? Well, something interesting about Rule 4E is this. Not only are there federal bases for service of the summons and complaint, but additionally, under Rule 4E, you can use state rules of service. So for example, if you sue somebody in Florida and serve them in Florida, you sue them in federal court, well, you could use the Florida rules of service as well, OK? All right. So that means there's federal bases for service of the summons and complaint, but you also, under Rule 4E, incorporate any relevant state rule of service. Now, I don't think that the latter thing is going to come up in the bar exam unless the bar exam tells you what the state rule of service is. So know that the state rules of service are incorporated into the federal rules of service themselves under Rule 4. Okay. Now, Rule 4 deals with the summons and the complaint. <coughs> All right. So that's the document the documents that start off the lawsuit, as well as a third party complaint, right? But after the original complaint is served, you don't serve under Rule 4, instead you serve under Rule 5. 
So if I sue somebody, okay, the summons and complaint goes under Rule 4. You know, you'll have a process server, for example, sue them. You can't su serve them yourself. I'm the plaintiff. I can't serve you. We gotta have got to have somebody who's a non-party over the age of 18 serve the defendant. All right, so the defendant has been served. Well, now the defendant's got to serve me an answer, right? The defendant doesn't have to have me served by a process server. Rule 5 deals with service after the summons and the complaint. And now, under Rule 5, there's a whole bunch of additional ways to serve. For example, the defendant could serve the plaintiff um, by mailing the answer, okay? If the parties consent, you might be able to email the answer, and so on. Um, and so forth. Okay. The finally, Rule Six deals with timing requirements. Okay. So, for example, um, you may recall that if plaintiff sues defendant, then the defendant, under normal circumstances, has 21 days to answer the complaint. Right. However, Rule Six indicates that when there's a set number of days to do something, all right. Well, how do you compute time? Well, what you do under Rule 6 is you ignore the, the day on which the event happens, then you add the additional days, and then the service is due by that last day. So if I'm sue, sued on day one, okay, well, I, the defendant, have 21 days to answer. So we ignore the first day, and then we add 21 days, so day 22 is when the answer must be served. But what if that last day falls on a weekend or a holiday, right? Well, then the, the response is due on um, that next day. All right? So you have to ask whether or not the service is actually due on a day that's a holiday or, or, or a weekend. And then you go to the next day that's not a holiday um, or a weekend. Another thing you might, that you might be tested on that might trip you up is the three day rule under Rule 6E. All right? So suppose the plaintiff sues the defendant, okay? And the defendant answers, and the defendant's answer includes a counterclaim. All right. Well, does the plaintiff have to answer the counterclaim? Does the plaintiff have to answer a counterclaim? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. If the plaintiff doesn't answer the counterclaim, then, then you have a default. So the plaintiff has to answer the counterclaim. But remember how I told you. So I'm plaintiff, and, and, and Dean Singer here says the defendant, and then she counterclaims against me. Well, I've got to answer her counterclaim. But I also said because. Her answer is not the initial uh, complaint. She can serve me over the mail. Okay? Well, Rule 6E tells you that in certain kinds of service, we add three days for responding, right? So Dean Singer, say, serves me her answer with counterclaim um, by the mail. Well, then I get three additional days to answer her counterclaim because she served me by the mail. Same thing goes with email. Now, why does this rule exist? Well, the simple answer is, is it typically takes about three days for mail to filter through the system, on average, right? So we add three days to compensate for the fact that, that she'll put her, her answer in the mailbox on day one, but I'm not likely to get her answer until day four, right? So I get three additional days to answer. Okay, now here's what I'm going to do. I want the personal jurisdiction video to start off, so I'm just going to stop this and start again immediately.